a Darwin apartment that almost collapsed. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, I'm Florian Heiser and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. I thought we'd have a look at this article about a Darwin apartment that almost collapsed. Now we looked at this one previously, this building, there's a whole series of them in the Northern Territory. I think the one we're looking at, or the example, is the Catalyst building here. And there were several others that were designed by a structural engineer. And, well, let's just say it's now under review and investigation. And there are structural props on some of the buildings. Let's have a look at this article. The Darwin apartment block came close to catastrophic collapse during construction, court documents say. So close to a catastrophic collapse. Now, I'm certain that what has happened means we don't need to worry about that now, but the fact that that happened during the construction or potentially could have happened during the construction is a huge life safety issue. It is a huge life safety issue. Recently, some a gentleman died on a building site in New South Wales. He fell down a lift shaft. If issues like this happen on these buildings, while you're building them, people die. People die. You want to know why there's a wage gap between, you know, a subby that's working on site and someone working in aged care or, you know, childcare? That's the reason. You know, wiping shit isn't as bad as nearly dying. A multi-story apartment complex in Darwin came close to catastrophic collapse during its construction, according to court documents. In a $6 million lawsuit against the structural engineer at the center of a separate government probe into non-compliant buildings. The Allure building at 286 Casuara Drive in Nightcliff has since been fully rectified to ensure, ensure it meets national standards. Well, let's have a look if that was actually the building I was talking about, because it looked the same. It looked the same, and they may have used the picture there. Casuara Drive. No, it's not. It's not. It's right here. So we'll put that one down. So we've got another building that, um, well, that we need to be aware of. Allure Drive. So it's, wow, this is a nice spot. Let's, let's jump into Street View here and get a bit of a look. A bit of a look here. And there you go, look at that right near the beach. You could jump that fence, go for a little swim. And here's the building. I mean, you know, large, nice views from those apartments. You'd be paying a pretty penny for that even in Darwin, I imagine. Even in Darwin. And there you go. So, I mean, if you're not familiar with what happened, we'll jump to the issue with the engineer. And this is in the previous article. So New South Wales government knew of structural flaws in Darwin's buildings, but didn't tell owners. So they, they were doing an investigation into the buildings this engineer was working on and they hadn't informed, or there's no mechanism for them to advise potential buyers of these buildings. And one gentleman purchased a unit and just a couple of months later, all these issues were identified. And here are the key points. A Northern Territory government commissioned report concluded nine buildings were non-compliant more than a year before the issue was publicly disclosed. So that was the major issue there. And this is through with the slab design. At least five units were purchased by unwitting buyers during that time. The repair bill in one of the buildings is likely to exceed $1.5 million. And I mean, here we go. Here's the other one, the catalyst. So it's the same engineer that worked on this building and several others. And uh, here's, here's the poor, you know, Richard, Sega, who bought a unit in Catalyst in uh, July 2018, just before the report came out. And you kind of got to feel sorry for him because what due diligence can you do if the government has this information and doesn't release it? This is where I see uh, blockchain technology having a place. Recording of this information that needs to be publicly accessible to allow buyers to make informed decisions. You know, Particularly with regards to even the fire cladding, what materials are put on buildings. There has to be a way to start recording that. Maybe I should try and turn that into a, into a project and try and get some venture capital. 
you know, every material that comes on site has to be scanned and it's recorded in the blockchain. Every member of the public can get a report. It can't be altered. It can't be altered. I'm not sure. That could be a that could be a viable product. We'll we'll see. I'll 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 put write some stuff down. You never know, guys. You never know. I may I may issue a a proposal to you. You know, we'll go ASX, we'll list it, and make some money. But back to this. Uh that's the issue. It's this information that the government has that isn't publicly accessible. So the whole argument of buyer beware in some regards can go out the window. And I mean here you go. We've got the build uh, buildings around here and the timeline of non-compliance. So May 2017, a ministerial briefing revealed that DILP's initial investigation was triggered by an alleged puncturing shear failure during the construction of a building in Rapid Creek. The building was later rectified to meet the National Construction Code, so the issue isn't with the code. October 2017, DILP engages an independent consultant to assess the structural integrity of nine other buildings linked to the structural engineer John Scott. January 2018, consultants provided the final assessment report to this department, concluding that all nine buildings were non-compliant with the NCC, the National Construction Code. 2018, consultants and DIPL worked with Mr. Scott on reaching an agreement on the level of compliance with the NCC. And in February 2019, individual building reports, including rectification recommendations, are completed. In April 2019, unit owners were finally informed of the problem. Were finally informed of the problem. So, does anyone here trust the Northern Territory government? So let's jump back to this article. So, uh, but docu documents tendered in the Northern Territory Supreme, Supreme Court allege that fi the five-story complex, which is now advertised as the epitome of waterfront living, almost collapsed before it was completed in 2017. Bugger. Head contractor, Cara Developments, is suing building structural engineer John Scott of JWS Consultants for alleged breach of contract, negligence, and misleading contact, conduct. So there could be a lot of issues here. We don't have enough information to reach a conclusion, and that, that will be the, the process of well, the courts to decide, and hopefully there'll be a thorough investigation into it. So it, it could be a structural issue, it could be a subcontracting issue, it could be an issue on site, it could be someone just didn't put the rear properly or they loaded too much concrete into it or the formwork, and it you know, could have been a whole range of different things. Uh, for those of you with, with uh, experience in this type of construction, guys, engineers, sub, you know, subbies, tradies, let, it, let me know in the comments what do you reckon, what do you think it would be. So it came close to catastrophic collapse. A statement of claim alleges that major faults began to appear in December 2016, including cracking in the first floor concrete slab, and a large hump where a, column with, where a column connected with a slab. Large hump? Wow. That's, you don't want that. So this, this, is, uh, this was the building I imagine is what drew it, this engineer or this structural design to the standards of the, or to the attention of the department. The construction site was, site was subsequently closed by the head contractor in circumstances where the potential the complete failure of the slab presented an immediate, apparent, and significant risk to the safety of employees, contractors, and other entrants to the site, the documents stated. So we can commend the head contractor for taking that action. We can commend the head contractor for taking that action, for doing their job and ensuring the safety of uh, people coming onto the site. Because in the end, that is a really important part of working in construction, is ensuring health and safety and keeping people alive. You don't want to die building a building like this, you know? A different structural engineer who was engaged to inspect the faults concluded the slab had been under-designed. The structural failure observed over the central column and the rear of the development came close to catastrophic collapse, which may have initiated a general collapse, the document stated. The site remained closed for a further month while Temporary support structures were in place. Permanent rectification works were then undertaken to ensure the building met national guidelines prior to its occupancy certificate being issued. Fantastic. Fantastic. That is what we want to see. We want to see rectification taking place. The works included the installation of 16 new columns and the extension of 10 existing columns and the addition of steel support beams to reinforce the slab. So it wouldn't have been a cheap exercise. It would have been cheaper to design it right. 
the first time around. And that's just a general rule of construction. It's a general rule of life, isn't it? Cara Developments is suing Mr. Scott for $6.2 million for allegedly designing and certifying slabs that were not fit for purpose and ultimately led to major faults, the court papers state. The claim includes the cost of rectification works and the financial penalties Cara Developments suffered because of the building not being completed in the required time frame. The court is scheduled to return to the case is scheduled to return to the New South Wales Supreme Court on October 11 for the directions of hearing. That will be interesting. So that's not too far away. So two-year investigation into structural engineer. The issues that emerged at Allura Building in late 2016 and early 2017 prompted the Northern Territory Department of Infrastructure Planning and Logistics to launch a two-year investigation into the work of Mr. Scott. That probe led to the identification of nine other buildings across Darwin and Palmerston that were deemed to have uh, concrete transfer slabs that did not meet Australian standards. Some of the affected buildings have since been fixed, but several still require permanent solutions to ensure they meet the National Construction Code. DIPL, as a reference, referred Mr. Scott to the Building Practitioners Board for alleged professional misconduct pertaining to a pattern of non-compliance with the Const National Construction Code. The board was due to hold an inquiry last month, but the hearing was delayed and a new date has not yet been set. So, that's interesting. That is very interesting. So there's a few sides to this story. You know, the government was doing that investigation, the information wasn't released. But you can't have them releasing information for every investigation, or can you? We only have heard one side of the story. We've only heard the developers and what, ha what happened. You know, how do we not know that the contractor wasn't pressured into doing particular things. I'm not sure. But the other engineer says it was under-designed. And if it's happened on several buildings, then, well, that's concerning. Anyway, guys, I'd like your input. It'll be interesting to follow this case. We'll need to see what comes out of it. But the problem is here. A lot of these other buildings, this one was caught. This one was caught before the certificate was issued. Occupancy, occupation certificate was issued. The other buildings weren't. The other buildings weren't, like the one we looked at uh, in this article here. Not this one, this one here, Catalyst. It wasn't caught, it was occupied, people bored. Now they have to do rectification work after. Some buildings will have less issues than other, that's understandable. But here is the fundamental issue with our procurement process. The certifier depends on the information that they receive. They don't have the capacity or the professional skill to make a judgment call on the engineering design. Yeah, an architect doesn't either. Yeah, project manager doesn't either. The engineer does. The engineer will sign a form certifying that they meet all these requirements and hand that over to the certifier. And the certifier will take that form, form from the engineer and go, okay, you filled out the form correctly. Stamp, here's your certificate of classification. Here's your occupa occupation certificate. Occupancy certificate, here you go. That's the problem. That's the problem. So, I mean, do we need a third party, an additional engineer to check work, check the signs? Would that be another marketing aspect? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe there's actually a business in providing a service where you've got, you know, you provide a secondary certifier, you provide an additional uh, engineer, you provide all these additional services. Hmm. Maybe, maybe I need to start, and then combine it with a with a with a um, Ethernet-based uh, crypto uh, token to record all the data. You know, I might be inventing a business right here as I make these videos. <laughs> anyway, guys, let me know what you think. What do you think your solutions could be to these issues? And uh, have a great day. Talk to you later.